Now we read once again this time from Second Timothy, Paul's second letter to Timothy, in Second Timothy chapter 2. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. We'll end the reading there at the close of that 13th verse. And we trust that God will give his own blessing. Rest upon the reading of his precious word here this evening. To study the writings of the Apostle Paul is to discover that in pressing home those truths vital to the Christian experience, he employs images and illustrations drawn from a wide spectrum of human circumstances. We might say that he was especially gifted in this matter So, on occasions, we have architectural analogies. On the one hand, we are described as the temple of God, living stones in that edifice, while on the other we are counseled as to the nature of materials to be employed in building on the foundation of Christ. And then we have anatomical analogies. The church is compared to a human body, and therefore its members to the various organs. We have agricultural analogies. Life, we are told, is about sowing and reaping. Service involves planting and watering as we all look towards that great final harvest. We have athletic analogies. The various disciplines in the ancient Greek games forerunner of the modern Olympics are utilized to put before us the particular challenges of Christian living. And then there are army 
analogies. Where the believer is reminded to engage in the fight of faith. And that he may do so attired in that divine protection, the whole armor of God. And it is this extended metaphor that gives us the final title in this series of studies. The believer is to be a soldier. 2 Timothy 2 and the verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The church on earth is often spoken of as the church militant. I'm sure you will have heard that expression, the church militant. And therefore its members are combatants in that struggle. The struggle that will continue until the end. What then may we say in connection with the one who is to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Well, there are three very simple things that I want to point out this evening. First of all, I want to say a word or two about the adversary he faces. The adversary he faces. If there is a conflict and soldiers engage therein, then there must be an adversary. There must be an enemy. And as someone has said, the first step on the way to victory is to recognize the enemy. With God's word before us, we can be in no doubt as to the identity of our great foe. And so the first thing I would say in respect of this enemy is that he is satanic. The adversary is satanic. He is the devil. There is a war waged by him and by the unseen hosts of hell. Fantasy, people say. Altogether incredible. Some 45 years ago, a survey showed that only 21% of the British population believed in a literal devil. 21%. But of course, the key point in that observation is that we are going back 45 years. And I suspect the figure is much lower by now. But to deny this, to deny the existence of this being, is to fly in the face of Bible teaching. Now, that is no great struggle, I know, for many in this age. They are not interested in what we may read within the covers of this book. However, as Christians, we affirm the doctrine of Holy Scripture. And when we engage with the Word of God we discover that the devil is described as a living being. A being who is the implacable enemy of the Lord and of his people. Just consider how the Lord Jesus Christ puts it. If I take you back for a moment to the Gospel of John and to the chapter 14, one of the things that strikes me when we work our way through various scriptures that pertain to this matter is the very remarkable series of titles that are given to the devil. And of course we begin with the Savior himself and here in John 14 almost at the end of that chapter the verse 30 he says hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh. 
and hath nothing in me. Well, I say to you this evening, the Lord Jesus Christ here is speaking of Satan. He's speaking of the devil. And he describes him as the prince of this world. If you go a little further in the New Testament Scriptures and you think about Paul and the second letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Here's another very striking title. Second Corinthians 4. And here, of course, he's thinking about those who have not been brought to a knowledge of gospel truth. They have not been brought to a saving relationship with Christ. In Second Corinthians 4 and the verse 3, he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. How does Paul describe the devil in this verse? He is the God of this world. Well, I suggest to you that if we were to try and summon up language with which to employ uh, in order to describe the evil one, Satan, the devil himself, we would hardly dare use language like this. At least not of our own volition. We would stop short of describing him as a god. But Paul says he is the god of this world. Peter sought to warn the believers of his day concerning the malevolent purposes of Satan. How does he put it over there in First Peter chapter 5 and the words of verse 8? He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So here is Peter trying to instill within the hearts and minds and souls of these believers the reality of their great enemy. And he speaks of him as an adversary. He speaks of him as a roaring lion. And I suggest to you that is probably the fiercest image he could employ. A roaring lion. One more example I will give you. This time it is from the writings of John in the book of Revelation, the chapter 12. And in Revelation 12 and the verse 9, here we have a series of titles. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And there, of course, is a title that is especially poignant as far as the people of God are concerned, for the devil is the accuser of God's people. He always has this malevolent purpose in relation to believers. We see evidence of that on occasions in the Scriptures, and certainly he is still about this evil work. I say to you this evening, put all of these things together. This is not the caricature of so many cartoonists. This is not the playful figure with pointed ears and a forked tail. This is an evil genius. This is someone unspeakably cruel, incredibly cunning, powerful beyond all human imagination. This is the devil who is set before us within the pages of Holy Writ. Who assailed our first parents, Adam and Eve? Satan did. Who tempted Job to turn his back on God? Satan did. Who prompted Judas to betray the Savior, Satan did. Who hindered the apostle in his evangelistic endeavors, Satan did. On and on it goes. Satan attacks relentlessly. 
and they say he does not exist. Every child of God knows the devil exists. If you did not know before you became a Christian, certainly you have known since. His attacks are of various sorts. Those attacks may be physical. Paul had experience of that and he referred to it over there in his second letter to the Corinthians in a very familiar passage, 2 Corinthians 12. And in verse 7 he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. We are not saying, of course, for one moment that every physical trial or affliction is satanically inspired. Nor am I suggesting that illness or affliction is the inevitable result of some sin or temptation to sin. Not at all. All that I am saying in this regard is that here is a realm in which Satan has capacity to operate. Otherwise we would not have a statement like this in God's word. Paul is talking about his physical affliction, his thorn in the flesh. It is the messenger of Satan, he says. In some way, there is a satanic hand at work there. His attacks may be physical, his attacks may be mental. We're here in 2 Corinthians, if you go back to that portion we just noted a moment or two ago. 2 Corinthians 4 and the verse 4 speaks of the God of this world blinding the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan blinding the minds of men and women. Have you ever wondered, dear believer, when the facts of the gospel are set before individual souls and you struggle to come to terms with the fact that seeing those things before them, understanding those things, having the capacity you would think to embrace the truth, there are men and women and young people who after long exposure to the gospel are still outside of Christ. They are still rejectors of this blessed message. Well, here is some part of the answer. The God of this world hath blinded their minds. This is a work that is going on. It is going on apace today. A little way over in Second Corinthians, this time in chapter 11, we find Paul expressing the same kind of concern, I suppose, this time not in relation to the unbeliever, but in relation to the believer. For he says in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And as I say again, he's speaking here to those who are believers. And if you analyze the language that is used here, you'll see something of the ability of the evil one to work in this area, the area of the mind. That's why it talks about the serpent beguiling Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan is a liar. Christ reminds us that he is a liar from the beginning. He is a deceiver. He will twist and pollute and confuse man's mental processes to gain his unholy objectives. There are believers out there, even in this present age, who have been altogether deceived and deluded in relation to the simplicity and the plainness of the gospel of Christ. Satan attacks physically. He attacks mentally. He attacks, of course, essentially in a spiritual way and with spiritual intentions. I often think of that portion that we are given 
near to the beginning of the church in the New Testament age in Acts chapter 5. And you'll know this story here. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira and how they were wrought upon by the evil one. And of course you will see how Peter understands the way in which they conducted themselves here. Acts 5 begins a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? without going into all of the details and indeed all of the consequences of this evil act we see Satan leading these two individuals to commit this deed to the detriment of the church fellowship and so seeking to create disharmony and discouragement among the people of God there in that place well this is our adversary this is our enemy the evil one himself The adversary is satanic. The adversary is spiritual. Because the devil is not a physical being, but a spiritual one, then that is the realm in which this warfare is waged. We read at the outset of the meeting this evening from Ephesians chapter 6, and in that portion of we are shown that our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places or heavenly places. And all of this is meant to convey to us the sense that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Of course, there will be outward and physical and visible aspects of this conflict. But these merely reflect the struggle that is being played out in the inward spiritual realm. And that is where the battle is raging. Remember how the Lord Jesus Christ taught. Uh, One example is there in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. If you think about it for a moment, Mark chapter 7 and the verse 18. Mark 7 verse 18, He saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And of course what the Savior is saying is that all of these things originate in the heart or in the soul. Therefore, This is about a spiritual issue. This is about something that begins inside. It's not about the circumstances in which we may be placed in the world. It's not about our environment, pure and simple. It's not about the particular temptation that is set before us. There must be something within. And so Satan will seek to assail us in our hearts and in our souls. Because within there is something on which he can work. Remember what the Savior said? The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. We can't say that. Because of the depravity of our own hearts. And because of the fact that that weakness will be there, it will be there until our dying day. The adversary is spiritual. The adversary is specific. And I mean by that that he targets those against whom he moves specifically. Indeed, we might say he targets them singly. I was struck 
by the observation made by one preacher when he said, When there were only two human beings on the face of the earth, the devil fought them one at a time. You ever think about that? Only two human beings on the face of the earth, and the devil fought them one at a time. He will attack us individually. He will attack us on the ground where he has best hope of success. He will note our weakness as individuals. And therefore the temptation that he will rise up to employ against you will be best suited to your character, to your personality. Maybe altogether fruitless and altogether hopeless with another, but with you, a different story. The Lord Jesus Christ reminded Peter that he was praying for him. And that passage is found over in Luke's Gospel 22. In Luke 22 and verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, what is there in verse 31 when he says, Satan hath desired to have you? In the original, that word is plural. The pronoun is plural. And in speaking to Simon Peter, the Lord is reminding him that Satan has this evil purpose in relation to all the disciples or all the people of God. But, he says, I have prayed for thee, singular, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So the Lord is assuring Peter that he was praying for him in the particular experience that he would have, contending with the evil one. Because the Lord knew exactly how Peter would be assailed. The Lord knew very well the valley of temptation through which Peter would pass. And he wanted to assure him that he was praying for him as an individual as he passed through that awful place. I must move on. The time is fast disappearing this evening. But let me point out not only the adversary that the Christian soldier faces, but the aspiration he follows. The aspiration he follows. What is the Christian soldier's objective in this great conflict? What is the goal that he has in view? It is often said that there are times when armies fail, not because they don't have the wherewithal to succeed, but because they do not have a clearly defined objective. And it is not laid out what the goal is, what the end purpose is. And they muddle along. Even in recent times, we think about some of these conflicts that have taken place in the Near East, and maybe that has been part of the difficulty. Armies have not had a clear view, an end purpose in view. Well, what is this aspiration? It is twofold. First of all, the defeat of the foe. The defeat of the foe. We want to see the evil one put to flight. James reminds us in that beautiful little verse, James chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's what we would wish. We would wish with all of our hearts as we engage with the evil one in this spiritual battle that he would be put to flight that he would be driven back. Remember this, dear believer, we will not succeed in destroying the devil. Nor can we be altogether rid of his influence. I often think of how the Gospels describe for us the experience of the Savior in respect of his temptation. If you ask people about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that unfolded, almost inevitably they will take you to Matthew chapter 4 and down through the verses and they will point out the 
three particular temptations through which the Savior passed. We have a shorter account in Luke chapter 4. But the interesting thing about Luke's account is that he informed us that at the end of that period of temptation, the devil departed from the Lord for a season. For a season. So in other words, he was coming back. And just as Christ was tempted throughout his sojourn on this earth, so will we be. But dear believer, we may also see the devil driven back. We may see him driven back. By faith, by prayer, by discipline, by Christian fellowship, by immersing ourselves in Scripture, we are to aim at his withdrawal. And the promise is, he will flee. That is gloriously possible. We are to aspire to the defeat of the foe in our own lives. And then, of course, at the same time, we are to aspire to the delight of the Father. You will notice how Paul goes on in the passage before us this evening in Second Timothy chapter 2. Into the next verse, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Just think of those words, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And isn't that to be our objective in all things? That our lives will delight him, they will please him, they will win his approval. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate example in this regard. Remember what he said, I do always those things that please him. Now, of course, in an absolute sense, you and I will never get there. We will never come to that place where we're able to say that everything that we do will please the Father. Because we will fail and we will fall. But nevertheless, that is to be our aspiration. That is what we are reaching after. So that in all of our conduct, in all of our conversation, in all of our thinking, we aspire to be those who are living their lives in a manner that will please the Lord. And so as we stand against the evil one, as we wage war against all his evil devices, we are to do it in a way that will please our Father, honoring him in all our attitudes and actions. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We're to be single-minded in the battle against the evil one. We're to have that clear focus. And we're to understand that we cannot possibly succeed in this warfare if we are forever turning back to the world from which we have been drawn. Finally, let me point out in closing the assurance that the Christian soldier finds. The assurance he finds. We have a resourceful, relentless foe. The battle is hard and the struggle is intense. Paul says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The word that we would use would be hardship. You're often reminded of the trials through which soldiers have gone in conflicts in past generations. And if you hear some of these stories that go back a hundred years to those who fought and in some cases died in the Great War, you will understand something of the hardship that those men endured. And that's the thought that Paul has in mind here. It is not going to be easy. But we must not despair. We are assured of success. We are assured of success by a number of things. First of all, by God's unlimited provision. Key passage in this regard is what we read from Ephesians chapter 6, and I will not take time to go down through those verses. But if you consider the description that Paul gives there of the Christian armor, you will discover that everything necessary is there 
everything necessary. What God provides will be effective. It will be successful. We cannot bemoan the inadequacy of our equipment. Sometimes soldiers do that. And again, we have heard it said, an army has failed because its equipment has not been sufficiently modern or they haven't had everything they needed. And when we examine the detail of this portion, we will discover that everything we need to engage successfully with our great enemy is right there. God has provided it for us. That's why it's called the whole armor of God. It's complete. Everything is there. Everything we need. God's unlimited provision. And then God's unfailing promises. One of the old Puritans once said that in this battle we are to send faith up the hill of promise to see and bring the news of Christ's coming and assured victory with him. Send faith up the hill of promise. And of course that hill of promise is found in God's word. There are countless promises of victory we have read some of them already this evening. I have no doubt you can identify others for yourself. We are on the victory side. We will not lose. We will not lose. And then we are assured of success because of God's unending presence. Paul said we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We are to fight in the awareness that the Lord is with us. He will not let us go. He will not let us down. This morning we referred to Paul's own experience as he engaged in struggle and in service for the Lord. And even when others forsook him, when there was no one to stand side by side with him in the conflict, the Lord was there. The Lord stood with me, he said. And I was carried through the Lord's presence made all the difference. And dear believer in this meeting tonight, it still does. It still does. May the Lord help us, each and every one of us, to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ.